Hello friends old and new from all over the world, welcome back to the channel. My name is Dion and today we have something very special on the bench. It's a Longin Ultracron from 1969 with a 36,000 beat rate. I see the watch is running and the date change works. So that seems to be okay. And the watch is in good visual condition. It has a radially brushed face and then polished sides. It doesn't have an actual bezel, but uh, what you sort of think of as a bezel is also polished. And we are gonna shine up the polished surfaces a little bit. And the killer left the DNA trail as well. I think it was the butler. The time grapher isn't quite sure what it's uh, dealing with here. And besides the starry night uh, picture we're looking at, uh, it also thinks that the movement is 28800, which uh, did scare me a little bit. I started thinking perhaps this was a uh, Frankenwatch that someone just put a 431 uh, bridge onto. But uh, we'll see. So the Ultracron was one of the very first uh, 36,000 beats per hour watches. Launched at almost the same time as uh, Seiko and uh, Girard Perigo. And it was marketed by uh, Longin as being the world's most accurate watch. And part of that uh, claim was a guarantee that the watch would not uh, run off more than one minute per month. And of course this was pretty much when the quartz was being uh, invented. So the world's most accurate watch, well, most accurate uh, mechanical watch, perhaps. What is certain is that uh, the high beat rate, so uh, most vintage watches uh, run at 18,000 beats per hour. And what that means is that it uh, ticks and talks 18,000 times in one hour. So this one then ticks 36,000 times uh, per hour, so twice as fast. And that might just sound like a number. But uh, if you think of a gyro, and for those whose uh, mouth started watering, no, I'm not uh, talking about uh, the Greek uh, fast food. I'm talking about the gyroscope. There's an effect that uh, we did in uh, science class when I was uh, much younger than I am now in which uh, we had a, a wheel with two handles on it and then the teacher would spin the wheel while we held it and then if you try to move the wheel sideways you feel there's a big resistance and that's the gyro effect. So when something spins very fast it's difficult to uh, sort of get it off course. And that is one of the main benefits with a high bit movement like this. It simply isn't that much affected by constant variations of uh, the position of the watch. But while uh, these uh, movements uh, provide a lot of uh, benefits, they also didn't really last, at least not for uh, Longin's uh, case. They were placed in uh, later versions of the Ultracron with a 28800 uh, movement so bitting at a little bit uh, slower rate, still enough to uh, get most of the benefits and still uh, also providing a much more smooth movement of the seconds hand, but still a sort of uh, backtracking or defeat perhaps if you will. The exact reason or reasons uh, why Longin kind of downgraded uh, the movement to a lower beat rate aren't really known, but uh, speculation is that uh, the oil and the lubrication would be a little bit faster uh, removed by the action of uh, the balance wheel and uh, the escapement, and that uh, the movement would require more frequent servicing. And if there's one thing watch owners are not good at, it's having their watches serviced. So my theory would be that uh, there would be some negative publicity around this. 
that this world's most accurate watch actually turned out to not run so well after just a few years. But uh, the exact reasons, we do not know. What we do know is that uh, Longin was really uh, a major force in the watch market back then. And uh, this movement, uh, 431, is uh, really a testament to uh, the fantastic engineering they were capable of. And as a big uh, vintage Longin fan, I do hope they kind of find their mojo again, which it does seem like they uh, might be doing. Anyway, we stripped down most of the movement. We're over on the dial side, taking off uh, the keyless works. These parts are what allows you to uh, set the time and to wind the watch. And in the old days, you actually had to use a key for both of those things. So that's why this one is keyless, using the crown instead. What I'm taking out here are the shock settings. As you can see, it's a jewel, or actually two. And uh, they help uh, the watch resist the uh, shocks if it falls or if you bump into something, so you don't break the pivots. But as I'm uh, looking at uh, the jewels, I see something else is uh, broken. So the center hole jewel is uh, cracked. It's not entirely broken, but it's uh, damaged enough to uh, disturb the power transfer. So that can explain the time graph for uh, confusion. We need to measure it so we can order a new one. And it turns out the outer diameter is 1.5 millimeters. So that makes for a really small donut. Also uh, not too good on the teeth, to be honest. And the hole needs to be 0 0.9 millimeters. So uh, they don't really make these anymore, and that's commonly a problem for vintage watches, but I did manage to find uh, some jewels with the right dimensions. Small problem is that it's a little bit uh, thicker or deeper, if you will. But we're going to try to put it in and see how it works. So we're just pressing the new jewel in uh, without really knowing if it's correct or not. So we might have to adjust that later, but for now it should be good. And then we can proceed with taking out the shock settings on uh, the balance side as well. Most watches have these uh, shock settings uh, for the balance. And the reason is that the balance pivots uh, are typically around 0 0.1 millimeter. So it doesn't take a lot to break them. Looking at uh, the automatic module, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about how that works later. For now, we're just going to rip it apart with all the violence a watchmaker can muster. Yeah, talk big, but uh, work small, literally. And today's fun fact, um, when we're talking about uh, 0 0.1 millimeters, that's uh, for our imperial uh, measuring friends, that's about 0 0.04 inches. And the fun fact is that uh, an inch is actually based on the metric system. It's defined as 25.4 millimeters. That's a definition of an inch. So if you're using the imperial system and measuring things in inches, you're actually just measuring them in millimeters times a constant. Anyway, just finishing uh, cleaning up the pivots a little bit. And then we have the watch laid out in all its glory. Let's get it into the basket and uh, get the cleaning machine running. All right, with the cleaning machine happily laboring along, let's uh, have a look at uh, the case. 
case is in uh, pretty good shape, but uh, the crystal is very scratched. So we're going to change that. One uh, thing to note, inside the case back, you have a couple of watch markers marks, and they are made with markers. So if you want to make uh, your mark, then that's the best uh, way to do it, but it will disappear in the cleaning. All right, so I mentioned that we will uh, take out some of the worst marks on uh, the polished sides of the case uh, and also on the bezel. So to do that, we're first going to press out uh, the crown tube and we have a tool for that. And then we can uh, fire up the polishing machine and uh, take out uh, some of the scratches and make uh, the polished sides a little bit more shiny. Going to first dress the wheel a little bit. The problem with uh, using a uh, polishing machine, uh, especially with uh, felt wheels like this one, is that you will round the edges of anything uh, flat or uh, squarish. Luckily, uh, this case is uh, rounded already, otherwise we will have to use a different uh, approach. I think it's uh, still important that uh, a watch looks coherent and that it looks its age. The dial in this watch is uh, in pretty good condition, but it uh, does have some marks. So uh, I'm not going to make the case look uh, brand new, that would not uh, fit in my opinion. After cleaning off uh, the cutting uh, paste that we used on uh, the right wheel, we're uh, giving the case a final uh, shine on uh, the left fluffy wheel here. And when we're happy with the result, we can put the crown tube back in again. All right, then for the crystal, see the old crystal is uh, pretty scratched, so we got a new one. In general, we just replace uh, crystals. It's only uh, relatively rare occasions where we have to polish out the scratches. So we definitely prefer to just uh, replace it. Some watches have special crystals, and then of course we need to uh, preserve the crystal. But in general, crystals are uh, consumables, something you change with every service. All right, we can then turn to uh, rebuilding the movement. We're going to treat a few of the parts with uh, something called Fixo Drop. What this uh, Fixo Drop does is to help lubrication stay put so that it doesn't creep to uh, places we don't want it. But uh, after treating uh, these parts with this fixer drop, we also need to clean the pivots, so the ends basically of uh, the wheel, so residue doesn't uh, rub off inside the movement. And then we're going to put a tiny little drop of uh, thin oil on uh, the shock settings before we put those back into uh, the balance uh, settings. And with that in place, let's see if the balance oscillates freely. So this is about uh, one-tenth of the actual speed. 
So the balance oscillates very rapidly in a movement like this. Let's see uh, what it looks like in normal speed. Kind of like it better in uh, slow mode, to be honest. Anyway, let's uh, build the movement. We'll uh, start with the barrel. The barrel contains the main spring, which is the only source of uh, power in the mechanical watch. And uh, this barrel is a bit special because it's uh, not intended to be opened. Normally we would uh, open uh, the barrel and take the mainspring out and at least clean it, perhaps uh, replace it if it's uh, not in uh, good shape anymore. But these uh, barrels are not intended to be open and it's a uh, pretty high risk of uh, not being able to close them properly again if we do open it. And I don't have a spare barrel, so for now we're going to try to reuse it. We're first going to build a train of wheels to make sure everything uh, runs smoothly. And that looks nice. If you have seen a few other videos on the channel, then you might recognize uh, this movement. Or its sibling, rather. The one I mentioned before, that they uh, turned down the beat rate from 36,000 to 28,800. I did a video on the beautiful uh, Longin Admiral that had uh, that movement. And it's uh, also a common myth with uh, high beat movements like this, that all the parts rotate much faster, and that's uh, of course not the case. Most parts rotate at about the same speed as in uh, other movements. It's just the parts that are closest to the balance that rotate faster. So it's basically the balance itself rotates obviously twice as fast as uh, 18,000. Uh, that was the standard back when this one was made. And then the pallet fork goes faster back and forth and the escape wheel and after that it's pretty much similar. There is, however, a bit more force from the main spring, so there is a bit more pressure on all the pivots. We're uh, over on uh, the dial side and we're going to put on the cannon pinion. And we have this beautiful uh, blue grease that we're going to use for the cannon pinion and also a couple of other pieces in the Achilles works. The cannon pinion is a friction fit onto the other end of the center wheel. And when pressing it on, it's uh, pretty hard on uh, the pivot on the other side of the movement. So that's why I use this uh, special holder that uh, supports the movement from the underside. And for the stem, we're going to use some elbow grease. Special formula. Lubrication is actually a very important part of uh, watchmaking. Making sure you lubricate uh, enough, but not too much, and that you use uh, the right lubrication. So what we're putting on here on the different posts where the wheels on the dial side will uh, run is uh, relatively thick uh, oil. Whereas on the keyless works where you have uh, metal parts, steel parts rubbing hard against each other. We're using uh, this um, blue grease that I showed you. It's all to minimize friction, obviously. But it's important to uh, be aware that uh, the amount or volume of uh, lubrication we use is very minuscule. You should basically not be able to see any lubrication. But that's still enough. And lubrication is also one of the things that watchmakers uh, often uh, complain about bitterly because it is very expensive. For instance, a two milliliter vial of uh, an oil can cost you like 20, 25 uh, US dollars. But then again, it's going to last you like 20, 25 years. All right, we got the base movement uh, together. We're going to oil the pallet. 
or sorry, let me just rewind. We're going to grease the pellets. And the reason we're using grease is again because of the high speed of the pellet fork uh, flicking back and forth. So if we used oil, that would be flung off uh, the pellet and get into uh, the wheel where we don't want it. So this uh, steel wheel on the left side here is the escape wheel. And you can see that one of the teeth uh, scrapes across uh, the face of the pellet stone with every time uh, the pellet flicks back and forth. And that's the friction that we want to minimize. And when we do this uh, a few times, we can spread the grease over all the different teeth. All right, then we can put uh, the balance back in. The balance spring or the hair spring in uh, these uh, kinds of watches is very stiff. So it's a little bit difficult to uh, put it in. But uh, with a few tries, uh, we managed. And it starts ticking. And then we're going to put a tiny little drop of oil in uh, those uh, jewels that are the bearings for the different wheels as well. All to minimize friction. Before uh, testing it on a time grapher, we're going to demagnetize the movement. The reason we do that is because magnetism uh, can badly impact uh, the hairspring, especially in, uh, in the watch. And that is not good for the timekeeping. And we see that the time grapher does recognize that this is indeed a 36,000 uh, bit per hour movement. So that's good to see. <coughs> All in all, this looks pretty good. We just need to make a couple of small adjustments. And that's uh, quite easy in this uh, movement. It's uh, really made to be adjusted uh, very finely, so we should be able to get it uh, pretty much where we want it. Tick, 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 tick. That is a very fast beat rate. Kind of stresses me out listening to it, to be honest. It's like, go, 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 go. It's much more relaxed with a standard 18,000 bit movement as most of the ones I work on are. But anyway, we see it runs quite nicely. It's not super high amplitude, but that's fine, given that we didn't change the main spring. And also these high bit movements tend to be a little bit lower amplitude than standard ones. Let's rebuild the automatic module. It has a reverser wheel. We have uh, immersed the reverse wheel in a concoction called uh, Lubetta V105. And this uh, wheel has uh, two wheels actually, one on top of the other. And each of them mesh with one of those other small wheels that you saw there and uh, thereby uh, makes uh, the final driving wheel for uh, the ratchet wheel turn in one direction as we might be able to see here. Gonna put a little bit of oil, and I really mean a little bit. It's probably like one thousand of a milliliter we're putting on here. What would that be in the Imperial system? I honestly have no idea. Is that like half a cup or something. Please educate me in the comments. I honestly have no idea. So with the automatic module in place, we can then uh, flip the movement over and uh, put in uh, the calendar works. Now the calendar works in this watch are really, really well done in my view. Maybe one of the best uh, implementations of uh, instant uh, changeover. Back in the day, and this is a 50 year old watch or a little bit more than that even. And back in that time, there were not a lot of watches that had uh, instant uh, flip over. And the way it's done in this one is uh, very cool, I think. 
There is this uh, snail, that uh, bronze-shaped little thing on top of uh, the intermediate wheel there. And the setting piece has a strong spring, so when it drops off uh, the snail, it really shoots the date one day forward. And it's also made so it's a pretty uh, good uh, semi-quick set. You just turn uh, the hands a little bit backwards after midnight, and then you can uh, flip the date one uh, date forward again. Before uh, putting the hands on, we're going to clean them a little bit. Just using some uh, Swiss Play-Doh and uh, pegwood for that. That uh, works quite well. Now for the watchmaker, one downside of uh, having this uh, instant uh, flip over is that it's quite difficult to find midnight because you typically just uh, turn uh, the hands until uh, the dead flips over. But with an instant flip over like this, all of a sudden it's there. So that can be a challenge. Oh, there it was. Let's see that in slow motion. That is very instant flip over. Anyway, as you might have seen, I flipped forward a little bit, both in the date and with the hands on. But uh, let's uh, go back and uh, put the hands on. Do a little time travel. Ooh. So just to be clear, the watch date does not flip over at midnight. The watch flips over when that little uh, setting lever drops off that snail. So it's our job as a watchmaker to put the hands on at that time at midnight. Or as close to midnight as possible, that is. And we see we got pretty close here, so we're happy with that. It should be at least between 15 minutes to midnight and 15 minutes after. Let's also have a look at how smooth the second hand uh, moves. 36,000 beats per hour means that uh, each second, the second hand moves 10 times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, ten. The standard at the time uh, this watch was made was 18,000 beats per hour, and that's uh, them, uh, five uh, moves of the second sand per second. It's so noticeably less fluid. So that's one of the cool things uh, with these uh, kinds of uh, watches. All right, we got uh, the movement back into the case. Gonna put in uh, the rotor. This uh, rotor has ball bearings, so we're also going to lubricate them with something special called Lubetta V106. Interestingly, I never heard what uh, V101 or 102 or whatever is for, but uh, 105 and 106 we use a lot. Inside the case back, you have this little spring that uh, clamps the movement uh, tightly in, inside the case. And we also need to put in a new gasket. We're uh, rubbing that in some uh, silicone. And then it fits snugly on the case back. We gave the case back a little shine as well, but uh, there's some engraving that we want to be very careful we don't uh, erase. And uh, we're going to find the leather strap that brings out the color in the dial. We uh, touched up the bezel a little bit and the case sides a little bit and the case back as well, so it's a little bit uh, shinier, but uh, hopefully we didn't overdo it. And the watch is ready for the wrist. I think that's a very handsome watch. Certainly a bit of uh, watch history right there. Good looking watch that uh, ticks at an insane rate, especially uh, 50 something years ago. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then uh, clicking like and subscribe will really help the channel. 
We'll be back with uh, more videos uh, shortly. Until then, ta-ta. <laughs>